Good evening, how are you? So we're gonna pin. What's up, Scott? Johnny on the spot. So it's going to ask you. Oh my God, Cedar Ford is so hot. It's so hot. I did two deliveries today, and my van doesn't have AC, and it was god awful. Um, absolutely awful. So, um, Wood Sport Scott. Let me see if I could bring you in. All right. What's this up? This looks better. Where's my Where's my volume? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you great. Oh, all right, all right. It's I'm, I'm I got a little juice, a little smoothie here. It's burning. All right. Awesome. I can see people joining, and I'm I'm sort of technologically challenged. So, you you've done well so far. Yeah, I'm I'm a, I usually fumble my way through. Um, how's your day? It's okay. It's okay. It's it's cooler here in good old Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's been it's been hot all summer. We've just been we've just been cooking here, so it's better. Yeah, it's um. I have a farm and I grow veggies. Do you really? Yeah. The heat and the rain, together they're, they're, they're disastrous. No good. Yeah. Yeah, it's been brutal. My studio, um, I'll pick up this camera when I feel a little more comfortable and whip it around, but I'm in, a, I'm in an old uh, canning facility and there's, there's skylights through this whole thing. So I'm working in, in sun pretty much all summer long. The sun kind of comes around in the hemisphere and it's, it's better in the fall, but um, you know, it's just, it's sun. It's, it, I mean, it, the, the space is, it's really hot in the summer and it's really cold in the winter and the rent's cheap. So, um, I mean, I can't complain about my space at all. It's, it's amazing, but it's, uh, it's rough and I'm feeling old. It's making me feel old. I'm, I'm feeling old and abused in here. I need a, I need a, you know, I need AC. I need, I need a better <laughs> dust collection system, and but whatever. So, so you. It took you a while to uh, track me down. You were uh, sending me texts at the AD show, Architectural Digest show, probably ten years ago, and um, I, I'm you know, over. You ignored me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, I didn't, I, maybe I did. I, I mean, it's, listen, you, you didn't know me from a hole in the ground, right? Yeah. Like, who is this dude? <laughs> <laughs> you were there, had your nice stuff going, meeting your people, want to make some money. Who's got time to fool around? Yeah, you're tired too from those things. I mean, I'm, I'm like that part of my brain, getting exercise, talking, being on with somebody. Man, that, that wears me out. So I'd go back to my hotel. My wife was with me, and I, we would just go. But we'd go eat somewhere and just go, go to sleep, basically. So, Yeah. So. So, okay, this is how we do it. First, just give us, tell us your name, where you're located. We'll get into the questions, and then we'll give you the floor. All right. Sounds good. I'm Scott McGlasson. My company is Woodsport. Uh, I've been making furniture for probably 25 years, um, kind of at a level where I'm just making my own pieces, my own work for maybe the last 15 years. Um, the last 15 years have been good. Um, uh, I've got a studio here in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. I live in Minneapolis, about six miles away. Um, it's a good life. I'm, I'm really into this sort of life balance where um, I mean, sometimes it gets out of whack, but I don't like to work too hard. Actually, I, I work really hard, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm doing it for myself. I make, I, it's very, I'm very independent. 
I've got freedom to say no. Um, it's it's good. It's good good way to to earn a living. I'm I'm proud of the things that I've made. Um, you know, people people come to me for my work and um, just I mean I'll complain a little bit if you ask me, but but I I really I mean the lifestyles it's been fantastic. So I'm I'm I feel very fortunate and uh, gratified for being able to do this. Oh, very nice. All right, so we're going to get started. What sound makes you happiest? What sound? Oh, man. Um, you know, I really like late summer crickets that are going on right now in August um, at night. That's a great sound. Other than that music, I listen to a ton of music, all kinds. All kinds. Yeah. Who's your favorite band? Oh man, I've got, I, I couldn't say one of them, but it would be probably, yeah, Tom Waits, Nick Cave. I like the Rolling Stones. I like Miles Davis, John Coltrane, a lot of classic jazz. Um, it's, uh, that's a, I, a lot of punk rock, classic rock. Uh, I like a lot of ambient music too, drone music, all kinds of weird Bang. stuff. So you got a range. You 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 can oh, go. Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's shop music. There's home music. We kind of rock out here a little bit yeah. more. I was talking to someone about that. Um, I, I like Whitney Houston a lot. I like a lot of. I like a lot of. I like Donny Hathaway. But those people, Luther Vandross. But those people aren't good for the shot. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I listen to a lot of Al Green too. I mean, I can't listen to Al Green at the shop. <laughs> no, no. Um, what sound bothers you the most? Uh, dull planer knives. I'm with that. What's your favorite cuss word? Um, I like the people that just just trust me, order the stuff, leave me alone, send me a send me an email after it's done, how much they love it. No, I don't, it. And I get a lot of those people. No, I don't know if you understood the question. Oh. What is your favorite cuss word? Oh, God. I thought you said customer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck, for sure. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, every other word. I'm, I'm terrible. I raised my kids when they were little. I just be like, ah, fuck that, you know, when they're two years old. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to try? Uh, uh, would I like to try or if I had the skills to do it? Yeah, if you had the skills to do it. Um, I mean, it like, like sort of, sort of more, more of a fantasy skills? Yeah. I wish I could paint, like be a painter. Um, I, but, but I can't, I've never been able to paint. I mean, I can, I'm, I'm a decent artist, but I just can't paint. So I'd like that ability. Um, the thing that I can do that I want to do more of would be a writer. So I've got some, I, I've got some book ideas coming up and, um, and I've been working on that and I've, I've majored in English in college and, and tried back then to be a writer, but I was too young and too green. So. And restless. Yeah, yeah. Just not enough material. It felt forced, so it was painful. What would you want on your tombstone? Nothing, man. I just want to be cremated and scattered to the wind. Okay. What word or phrase do you overuse? The aforementioned F word, probably. Right. What is your least favorite thing to do? least favorite thing to do uh god i don't i'm drawing a blank on that one i just don't do many things that i don't like to do you know i mean I'm, i it'll come to me i mean there are things but i don't know driving through the lincoln tunnel into manhattan i don't know no it's funny we, we talk about this because david stein is on and he's one of those people what i got to know him so the same time you were here, 
many years ago, I invited David Stein over as well. Yeah. And, and he responded and came over. Yeah. Because you were probably serving alcohol, right? No. Well, David brought his own. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know Dave well, for sure. He's a character. Love that guy. No doubt. That's yeah. exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, th this, I'm going to skip that question. What is it about your personality that drives your business? Um, I would say my aesthetic. Um, I mean, I, I, my voice is in all of my work, so, um, and it's an aesthetic that I've developed, and it, it sort of endures at this point. I mean, I've been doing it for so long. Pieces that I've made, probably, I've designed. You know, some of them are 20 years old, and they, they sell better these days than they ever have. So, so um, just that, just the aesthetic that I've developed. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, as we, as we talk about our first not introduction, one of the things that drew me to you was your amazing work. Oh, thank you. And, and me inviting you all over was kind of like this thing. Yeah. It seemed like it. It seemed like a good opportunity. I mean, I was I, like, I would. The other thing is, is I used to drink a lot more. Well, I, I just don't drink anymore. When I turned 50, I quit drinking. So, um, so shows I used to drink at them all the time and I'd go out and I, Dave Stein and I could share some stories, but um, that started kicking my ass. So that's another reason why I, I tend to not go out, you know, after shows. So I'm with you. What is it about your personality that hinders your business? Uh, probably being a, somewhat of a control freak, perfectionist, not, not letting go, not letting other people do things for me. But I mean, that also makes the work good. So, I mean, I'm, I've, I've sort of resolved that issue with myself. I just, it just is what it is at this point. So, but that, you know, back a long time ago, I could have probably blown myself up big if I could hire people and let things go. They don't have to be so perfect. They don't, you know, I don't have to micromanage, but just never worked for me. <laughs> ask, ask guys that have worked for me. I mean, it's. <laughs> I'm with you. Who would you travel cross country with on a motorcycle? On the back of my motorcycle? You have a motorcycle. Or, or, or just on a, on a, because I mean, I ride motorcycles. I don't know if I want anyone on the back. Uh, someone, someone had their own. Oh, they had their own. Okay. Um, uh, huh. I don't know. Like, I just probably David Bowie, if he was still alive, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> these are good questions. They're, did, did I get a primer for this? Do you send, you don't send these out, do you? Nope. All right, good. <laughs> no, cause there's no fun. Yeah, I know. I know. And, th and there's, there's a, a really, really talented, popular wood turner who wanted me to call and talk to him about what it was going to be about. I said, man, it's not that serious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, David Boyd, what was your favorite concert? Uh, I saw some really early great ones, like, you know, maybe Black Flag at, at Goofy's Upper Deck in 1983, you know, where there was just like this violent, sweaty punk rock club, stuff like that. But, um, you know, of late, I, I like I like the band Radiohead. I saw them in Chicago a couple of years ago, and that was like a big arena show. And that, that was pretty, I had never seen them before. That was pretty fun. So, okay. Do you have any childhood nicknames? Not really, no. Okay. When was the last time you cried? Oh, dude, man. Um, I cry. I cry all the time. I mean, I, as you know, uh, my wife passed away from uh, metastatic breast cancer that, about eight, eight, eight months ago. Ask. Say what? 
So that was the, the question I, I was going to ask was about spouse, and I didn't want to bring that up. Oh, yeah, you can bring it up. But, um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I just, I cry all the time. I've never, I've never, uh, I've never, I mean, the past two years, I've, I, I've cried more than, than I thought was physically possible. So, and I have no problem with it. I mean, I'll probably, I might start, if I stay here long enough, I'll start crying in front of, in front of you. So, no, yeah. no problem crying. I, I don't. Same here. Okay. I, I don't. I don't have any problem crying either because when I cry, I get it over with and I move on. Yeah, it's and good. I'm, and I'm no longer holding on to it. Yeah, it's all the toxins in your body coming out, your body and your soul. It's good. It's good for you. What impact do you want to leave on your industry? Um, I, I don't know about the industry as a whole, but I really do like making pieces that that I know are going to be around for a long time and and might make it make it into a secondary market um you know I mean if I just keep making these same pieces they're just out there in the world um so I I, lo I love that part about it it's just you know spreading spreading my seeds so okay when was the most difficult time for your business and how did you overcome it that one's pretty easy. Uh, 2008, Bear Stearns, when the when the stock market crashed, I was. Uh, that's what I that's, was. That's what all the people say who's been in this for a while. Oh yeah, yeah, and I worried about it this last this last year too. Um, but I wasn't affected at all. If anything, I mean, it's I've been I've never been busier, and um, so that wasn't a problem. But in 2008, I my business was a little different. I was more of a, a job shop and did did a lot of stuff for architects. I made furniture at the time. I did my pieces, but um, I sort of waited until architects, I mean, the, the money makers were, you know, going, loading up a truck full of, of tools and, and, you know, building stuff at my shop and then installing it and do it. I did all kinds of stuff that way. And I would do standalone furniture too, but um, it was okay. I was making a good living at it. And then, uh, that money just dried up. People lost their houses and, you know, the stock market crashed. And I, I just, my phone didn't ring for, I had some stuff in the pipeline, but my phone didn't ring for, for a long time, for probably eight months. And during that time, I just, I, I started coming up with pieces. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to, to market this stuff. So I, I took it retail and um, started doing shows. And the first thing I did, and it was the, farmer's market, Mill City Farmer's Market. And it was great. It, it just, it opened my eyes. Um, so I, I came up with a specific amount of, or specific pieces, tabletop items, and just put them out and people snapped them up. And um, it was great. So then that led to the, started doing the ACC show, American Craft Council shows here. That led to shows in Chicago. And then I did other ACC shows, um, in San Francisco, Baltimore, did the uh, Smithsonian craft show in DC and that and they started doing the AD show uh, in New York. And then it's just ever, it's been good ever since then along the, the way I've gotten a lot of press, gotten, you know, won a bunch of awards and it just sort of self generates at that point. But so that kind of kicked me in the butt. Oh, eight bear Stearns uh, to change things up. And, you know, I mean, in the end it, it, it worked out pretty good. How, how long ago did you start doing shows? Uh, right about then. So probably 2010, maybe. I started doing the, the farmer's market. Um, and this is like a kind of a fancy farmer's market and sort of upscale part of Minneapolis. And um, I did that right away. So like that, that summer, I mean, I was just, I was making stuff and still developing things. But um, so it was probably 09. I'd say. And what's the furthest you've traveled to do a show? San Francisco. I've done that. I've done shows on the East Coast. I've done a bunch of them on the East Coast. Oh, and I've done, I did a show in Ketchum, Idaho three times, which was absolutely fantastic. And um, Sun Valley Art Fair, it's called. And there's, there's a whole bunch of these shows all over the country. I mean, who knew? I didn't know. But, I mean, there's a lot of people that... You and David Stein. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Stein's done tons of these shows. So, 
when it, when I met him, him and I would talk about you know what shows and he he yeah that guy that guy could be a road warrior. I, I mean I'm I think my busiest year I might have done. Let me think, four shows. That that's plenty for me. But um, this Ketchum Idaho show, my my wife talked me into it, and uh, she's like, "This it'll be great. We'll camp our way there. We like we love going to the Rockies and and in the mountains." And um, so we did it, and I would just rent a giant. What's that? She was a camper. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What, I mean, it, what, what kind of camper? Uh, a car camper. You know, you put the tent in the car. You go into a. You know, you might hike from the campground or something, but. But, you know, no, that's, that's, a, that's a real camper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I yeah, no, it is. It is. I, I backpack, too. So like where you put everything on your in your pack and walk into the mountains for I, I've been doing that the past few years. That's that's a little more real if, if you ask me. But um, no, she she definitely and she wouldn't she wouldn't do that. She's a little too she was a little too glamorous for that. But so we did this this show and it was fantastic. I sold I, I think I basically sold out of my booth. You know, you just lo load everything up into the, and I had a trail. The first one, one I did, I had a trailer. I loaded it in a pickup truck, like an F-150, and loaded everything. Basically, she would always say it's like, it's like traveling with an, uh, a small apartment's worth of furniture, which is true. Uh, so you load it up. I'd have casework, chairs, my lamp, stools, side tables, some, some tabletop stuff, kind of everything's cash and carry, so you try to sell it. And it, and it worked out great. So I did that three times and we had a blast doing that kind of stuff. So that's probably the most sort of intensive show that I do. The AD show is crazy though, too. I've done ICFF, those New York shows, man. Whew. They can kick your ass. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a hard place to live. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any black friends? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. Yep. Do you often see people of color in your industry? Uh, not that many. I, I did have one black assistant. Um, it's been a while, but no, not that much. Um, no. Who would you not, most not enough for sure. Yes. David Stein said, New York, hard place to live, great place to sell furniture. Yes. That, he's got a good point there. That is, there's, that, that is absolutely true. There's a lot of people here with money, and they ain't scared to, uh, to spend it. Oh, yeah. I, I, most of my work goes to New York or California, so I, I know. Who would you most like to have a conversation with? Whew. Uh... Uh, maybe William Burroughs. Okay. Would you travel to the moon? No. What was your best business move? Buying a lathe. What was your worst business move? Uh, I've kind of had some, some sort of dead ends where I've tried to push myself to have someone you know pick up me for a spokesperson and i just feel like an ass i just feel like an asshole at the end of those things where i mean they sort of in initiated a couple lives sort of initiated too but i just feel, i feel like a sellout at the beginning of it and then when it doesn't happen i feel like an asshole so the, probably those sorts of things okay what advice would you give to someone starting out uh my my advice for, for this, for, for kind of any artistic creative endeavor is just make really kick-ass shit and get it in front of people. I mean, it seems really simple, but that's it. You got to get it in front of them and you got to just, you got to just make it. Just woodshed, just make it and get it out there. Okay. Now, this is a question I've always asked. I've always thought about asking in my car, but I've never put it on paper to ask. So I'm going to ask it now. Would you consider your shop a wine and cheese, two beer and burger, or three water and bread? 
Uh, probably beer and burger. Okay. All right. Mine's more like water and bread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is beer and burger. It's not wine and cheese for sure. And there's some nice stuff. Yeah, no, to totally. Okay. Are, you, are you trying to work up to beer and burger or are you okay with water and bread? No, I got to get to beer and burger. Yeah. But, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a job shop. Yeah. So one day we, we're doing 1,200, 1,500 square foot of flooring. The next day we're making the table. And, you know, I'm a, I'm, I got a weakness for old machines. Yeah, I've seen that. So, you know, I got too many. And, and we, we did a panel and we talked about, and, and you know this, the importance of having space in your shop to work. Oh, God. It's everything. Yeah, I don't. I have machines. So when I got to do a big job, I got to go out on the street. <laughs> <laughs> you pull them out on, they're on casters and you. you no, no, no. I break you, Sometimes I'll, I'll block off and if I need room, I'll finish something and we'll sit it out on the street. Okay. <laughs> So um, now we're done with the questions. All right. We could get into your journey, how you got into to doing what you do, and uh, the things that have led you to uh, where you are and the things that have affected uh, you as a human being and, and, and how you do your work. Um, so uh, I hope I don't repeat myself, but yeah, I started this. 25 years ago and uh i was working in education and there's a fringe benefit of um many and i work for minneapolis public schools you could take votech classes and I, I started taking woodworking classes and i just absolutely loved it and uh long story short i was burning out uh i was actually i had applied for gotten into and was was signed up for grad school and i i just quit I just, I just dropped, I, I stopped. I still worked for Minneapolis Public Schools for a couple of years after that, but I was like. So what did you do for Minneapolis Public Schools? I worked with, um, I kind of worked with the tough kids, trying to keep them in school and sort of a liaison and a lot of behavior issues, that sort of thing. Um, I, I did some like substitute teaching. I, so I was never licensed. So the grad school would have gotten me licensed. Um, so I, st I quit before I, you know, I kind of pulled out of that before I got to that point. So, um, and at a certain point, I just, I just quit the schools and went back to painting houses, which was my college gig. And I did that for a couple of years. I continued with woodworking, learning, learning that whole thing. It was, it was a cabinet making program at MCTC. And then I joined a shop with some other guys, like-minded guys, a couple of architects and designers, um, and just started making making things with with them and, and developing my sort of my my line my collection i mean they're early pieces of course i didn't really i mean i was making things for my house mostly um i still that's still how i how i make stuff it's usually a need at the house and i'll make it my my wife would ask for something or you know i i have a need and um so i've gotten to the point now where sort of all the bases all the categories are covered um so I just slowly did it more and more and finally quit painting, joined this shop full time. Um, and then, um, you know, that led up to Bear Stearns and, and then 08 to now, uh, just making my own work. And, and um, these days, I haven't done a show since uh, the Architectural Digest show in 19 was the last show I did. And I think COVID kind of killed that show anyway, or they, they changed the name of it. And now it's at Jabbits. But um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I need to do them anymore. I'm, I'm having no problem selling work at all. I've got stuff on first dibs, um, relationships I've made with architects and interior designers over the years. Those, those just keep paying off. And then people just find my website and find me on Instagram. Um, so it's, it's pretty darn easy to sell work. In fact, uh, I'd, I'd rather be less busy than I am right now. So, um, I mean, good problem to have, but uh, I've got an assistant and he's going, he's in product design at, um, at University of Wisconsin and he's leaving me in a few weeks. So at that point, you know, I'm gonna try to, try to uh, thin things out a little bit, maybe thin out my, my product line a little bit too, you know, just do, he brought up this great point of, 
just make things that you can ship in a FedEx box because shipping is such a pain in the ass these days. And I, I had a white glove shipper that didn't make it through the pandemic. And um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm always just struggling to find people to ship. Actually, we've been shipping personally. Like my, I've got a, my youngest is in college. Last year, he drove to LA, he drove to Jackson, Wyoming, he drove to Dallas, he drove to Michigan. Um, in, in March, I drove to the East Coast. I'm doing that again in September. I've got, I've got stuff going to DC, Great Neck, New York, uh, Montauk. I'm gonna take the ferry across to uh, New London, Connecticut, and then I'm going up to Stowe, Vermont. So it, it seems kind of insane doing that. Like while I'm doing it, I'm like, it's so weird that I'm here. I am 55 years old and I'm driving this giant van full of furni my furniture and deli personally delivering. I mean, it just seems like such a weird business model, but oddly it, it works and it's kind of fun. I tell people about it all the time and they're like, oh, can I go? I want to go. And I'm so it, it seems to work, but um, that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, I'm I, I it. It's funny to say, but I'm kind of in legacy mode at this point, I feel like, where I still do design pieces, but um, I mean, it's the pieces that I've designed long ago that just keep selling and selling. And um, so it's pretty easy, you know, but um, I don't know, I, I could thin it, thin it out and do, do less, have a small, my, my shop is also huge and it could be smaller. We've got- How, how big is it? Uh, 5,300 square feet. I share it with one guy. Um, it's it's the same guy that I s moved into a shop with back in 2000. So him and I have been together for over 20 years. And um, there's a couple guys that have been with us for that long, but they've all they all have other jobs and they they still rent a little bench space here and they come in and make stuff or you know sneak cigarettes or drink beer or whatever they do. But it's it's mainly it's mainly uh, Duff is his name Duff Thury and he makes these giant musky baits they're like this big and his his business is nuts he just sells tons of these things um so he does well i do well it's mostly him and me every day he's got a, he's got a guy or two working for him i usually have a guy working for me and that's about it so um i've got a showroom here which has been great right now it, it's not looking so good um it's another thing that the pandemic sort of put an end to i mean i just haven't had many visitors or I've, I've had open studios from time to time over the years. And, um, I don't, I don't really do that anymore. So, um, now it's just kind of a staging area. It's, and also, uh, I've kept over the years, um, stock of pieces. So, you know, you walk in there and it actually looks like a, sh a showroom. It's got a lot of my work in there, but since the pandemic, I've, I've sold pretty much everything. People just, I, I the whole nesting thing, you know, people, people are just like, buying things, needing things, needing uh, retail therapy, I guess. So it's kind of decimated. It lo it's got, you know, my shipping shit in there right now, and it's just hasn't been cleaned for six months. So. Okay. So what drives you? Um, well, for a long time, I was just always obsessed about design and making things and making making things the way I want to make them so that I mean I would I would just be thinking about furniture pieces constantly um also uh I there were always wolves at the door when I when you know my kids were young I had to feed my kids uh my wife was my wife was a, a homemaker for she she had jobs she went to college and had a had a decent job out when she graduated from college but then she had a shoe store for a while. And then um, when my third kid was born, she's like, I'm, I'm just gonna raise these kids until they're you know, in high school and, and then I'll go rejoin the workforce. So we lived on my income. So we had some pretty lean years. So yeah, wolves at the door. I mean, I just had to, had to hustle to make money. So um, <laughs> making money drives me, I guess. Um, these days I, I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing fine. So um, I don't really feel feel that need. Uh, my all my bills get paid and such. But um, uh, so what drives me these days? The muse has kind of left me a little bit. I hate to say. Like I mean, I was always uh, 
you know, just, I mean, it was always design. It was always making new pieces, showing it to people, having people flip out, love it. I mean, that, that's intoxicating. Uh, that, that architectural digest show, I'd try to make a few new pieces for each year. And that, that sort of forced me to, to come up with new pieces. Um, that's gone now. Um, so, and then also, you know, it's just been a rough couple of years for me. I think I'm, I'm tired. I'm just, uh, you know, losing, losing my spouse just sort of maybe took the wind out of my sails a little bit as far as designing pieces. I mean, I'll, I'll still do it. I still want to do it. It'll come back. It usually does. But um, I can't even remember your initial, what drives you. Yeah. So I still come to work every day. I mean, I, I like, I like shop life. I like working. I, I love what I do for a, for a living. It's, it's never been, it's never, I, I've never had that thing where, I mean, when I worked for Minneapolis Public Schools, you know, Thursday, you'd start feeling pretty good. Here comes Friday. Oh, yeah, it's Friday weekend. And then the weekend comes and you're like, oh, it's great. And then Sunday night, you're like, fuck, I got to go back and do that shit again. That has never been the case here. I mean, I've I've come into work, you know, throughout my career on on the weekends. Like, hey, hey, baby, can I go into can I go into work and work on this stuff? You know, and she'd be like come on, you got to be here. You know, there, there was that sort of stuff. So I always wanted to be in the shop. Um, these days, n not as much. <laughs> what, what affects you outside of work? We talked, um, and you were telling me you, you were close to where the George Floyd thing happened. Yeah. What, putting work aside, how does life affect you? What affects you? What moves you? Um, an awful lot. I mean, I'm really connected to my community. I care about the world. I care about, you know, the politics. Um, I, I care about the environment, all that stuff. I mean, I, that it's it's been heavy, man. I mean, the... I, I can't lie. The Trump years were, were brutal to me. I mean, they, I, I just was not, that, sh that was some crazy shit with that guy. So, um, <laughs> George, the George Floyd thing was, was traumatic as hell. I just, uh, uh, yeah, that was four blocks, five blocks from my house where, where, where they killed him. And, um, God, I remember Lisa and Lisa was kind of at her on her last legs then too. So I was taking care of her. And um, yeah, that was that was brutal times in the neighborhood, man. For and then the and then the riots that happened afterward. I mean, we were freaking out. There were there were unmarked uh, pickup trucks cruising all over the place, you know, spraying gasoline at 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 the gas station just on the ground for someone to come on come along later and flip a match and burn that shit down. So. You know, I, I still there still really hasn't been a, a decent accounting of of who who burned the place. You know, I mean, people have been arrested. People have, are already serving jail time and it's people from all over the place. It's not it's not it wasn't Antifa. I mean, it, there might have been some of that. I don't know. But anyway, um, it was pretty complicated. But um, yeah, that was that was that was brutal. It was it was traumatic as hell. You could you could smell it. You could hear it. You could. I mean, it just went on and on for for five days. And um, it's kind of miraculous that there was just one guy that got killed in that whole thing. I mean, aside from, from uh, George Floyd, but there was one guy in a pawn shop. That, and it's kind of miraculous that, you know, the National Guard didn't kill anybody. And, and you know, other people didn't, you know, there, it's just kind of shocking that, that no, no one, no other people died. But, um, yeah, so I'm affected by the world for sure. I've got kids too. I've got adult kids. Uh, I worry about them. I, I worry about the world that they're living in. How did that make you feel about the place you live in and the world view on it? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I, I could go on and on about that. Um, Minneapolis was kind of, I, I mean, we've had some, some uh, racial issues here for a long time i mean there's the uh as as far as as um the gap the high school graduation all that sort of stuff i mean it's it's 
it's a pretty white city and uh, pretty segregated too. I'm I'm in a I'm in a pretty mixed area, but um. So, wait, what was the initial question again? I'm sorry. Huh? I, I, I'm getting over a cold. I've kind of got some brain fog. <laughs> How how did these events? Oh yeah, um, yeah, affect Minneapolis, right? Um, how you felt about the place you live from a world view? Yeah, um, I mean it it really shook things up, and we're we're still. I mean, we kind of had a mini revolution here, and there's still a lot of craziness here too. There's still a lot of lawlessness. Um, I think Minneapolis has always been, and when I say Minneapolis, I mean MSP, the whole area. It, it's always been known as a really cultural place with a good quality of life. And um, I mean, I still think it's that way, but, but man, we've got some scars and, and that whole thing uncovered some, some issues here, you know? And, and I mean, you get, you look at comments in the, in the newspaper or, or comments in um, on Facebook, God forbid, and people, people are just dissing Minneapolis left and right. Like, oh, I would never go to that place. It's so freaking dangerous. And, and, you know, I mean, I still, I still live here. I'm, I'm fine. I mean, I, we've, we've lost people in the neighborhood. A little bit people have moved out. There's been some, some white flight and that sort of thing, but not that much. I think most people have, most people are hanging in there. My kids, um, I asked them about it and they're just like, what, what's the problem? There's no problem here. It's fine. It'll, you know, it is what it is. It'll, it'll get better. It's kind of what I think, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely brought MSP down a couple of notches, but it's also uncovered some some shit that needed to be uncovered. So, yeah, not not just in your city, but in this country. Oh, for sure. Yeah. On a lighter note, and, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm also a, a, a big fan, and I'm going, and this is going to sound corny as hell. Did you know Prince? I see him. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, that, if you ever seen that guy with a t-shirt, nothing's been the same since Prince died or no, I think it said something like shit's been weird since Prince died, which is the truth. Yeah. Uh, Prince definitely. I saw Prince many times. I used to, I mean, in the eighties, I was kind of in the punk rock thing and post punk, but I was down at first Avenue all the time. I mean, that's where all, all the bands would play that would come through town. So Prince would be there. You'd see him once in a while. There'd be whisperings, you know, and then you'd see that he had this giant bodyguard with, with white hair. You'd see that dude and you knew Prince was down there somewhere under him, you know, <laughs> but I'd see him. But um, I also painted his house for, I don't even, let me think about how this even transpired. I had a friend that was his assistant. In fact, I knew a few people that was his personal assistant. He would sort of burn through him because he was very demanding. But uh, my friend Peter was uh, actually two of them. I, they were a married couple, P Peter and Barry. They were, I think they were the, his caretaker. Like they just, they just did stuff. And then they called us in to, to paint um, some interior stuff. So and then you'd go and you'd work and then he was, he'd go to Paisley park and you could be there. And then he would call one of them and say, I'm coming home. Everyone's got to go. And you'd have to pack up and go and um, paint his house. Some weird <laughs> dude, dude wanted some, some weird call. His, uh, uh, his girlfriend at the time, I th they, they matched her hair color for the trim. So it was like this, it was brown, you know, it was just kind of weird, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, his house was, he had a giant purple uh, baby grand in the foyer. And, um, you know, it was just kind of like this big suburban house. And then one day they just tore it down. I mean, be, like he was, it was when he was still alive. But, but I guess it just, out of the blue, they just knocked down. It, he still owned the property. So he ordered it, you know. It was on a really nice piece of land out in Chanhass and not too far from Paisley Park. But um but it was just kind of a, it was like a big, it wasn't really a McMansion, but it was, uh, and let's see, this would have been, this would have been the nineties. This probably would have been the mid nineties. So, I mean, he was, he was huge at the time. I think it was, it was after, um, you know, purple rain happened and then he was just the biggest rock star music star in the world. And then, and then, it, and then he had, you know, uh, 
what was the what was the one after that sign of the times i think did well but not as well and then he started just releasing stuff and fighting with the record label so he i don't think he was doing as well i mean he was still fine he was you know still doing whatever the hell he wanted he was treated like royalty in in minneapolis and in and in the world and then not long after that he moved to la so so yeah i have a i have a little bit of history with him he he was uh yeah i i, I incredibly sad day when he died and shocking i mean oh the other the other thing is is he was a uh, um he was a religious guy and didn't do any drugs at the time i mean he was just like he was a he was a complete health nut vegetarian just i mean he was he was cut you know i mean you know what prince i mean he was just and then to find out that he was addicted to to what killed him fentanyl but he was addicted to painkillers it was just perplexing i mean i man that was what 16 that happened when all those celebrities died and bowie died right around that same time that bummed the hell out of me too <laughs> yeah yeah so um shop tour How, how'd you talk to me about the turning how'd you get into the turning uh i, I started turning to take lessons I, I, well, cabinet making school, they had, they had lathes and I, I just remember one night looking back and there was, you know, they had them lined up, um, just old shitty Rockwell lathes. And I asked the instructor, what, what the hell are those? And he's like, those are lathes, give it a shot. And just gave me a little primer on it. And man, I loved it. Right. It was magical. You know, I mean, it's probably, you know, like when a, when a potter starts throwing, you know, it's, it's that feeling where you're just like, Oh man, I can do some stuff with this. So, um, I filed it away. I did some turning at, at school and, and, you know, made table legs and, and I was okay. It wasn't, I wasn't great. The lathes were kind of shitty too. Um, so then I ordered a lathe probably right around the time of, of the stock market crash, maybe a little bit before that. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just, I had some money. I had a, I, I just had some extra dough and I, I ordered a Powermatic lathe and um, they were a lot, they were fairly reasonable. They, lathes have gotten crazy expensive. It's becoming, it's become this really big hobbyist thing. So um, they're expensive, but um, I still have the, the sales order for it and it's framed in my office because at the time I was thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this thing. I don't know where it's gonna lead, but this is kind of this is kind of my grad school for me. I mean I could I could go back to grad school and get a get a you know an MA in, in English lit or something, or I could just buy this goddamn lathe and we'll see what happens. And and that's what I did. And I just um over over time, um I probably had it for a year before I did anything with it. And I think the first thing was uh what I call a dunce table. That was, that was the first piece of furniture I made. And it's a, just a little occasional table. And um, yeah, and since then I, you know, I make, I sell a lot of lighting pieces, a lot of lamps. Um, they've done really well on it. Um, it's probably a third of my work is, is maybe even more is, is made on a lathe. Uh, I just replaced the, the old lathe, that Powermatic with, a, with an American made, ooh, um, robust lathe, which I didn't know existed until <clears throat> the night before I ordered it. I was, I was, uh, the power Maddox, it's okay, but it, it, it I kind of wanted a little more capacity and, you know, some things were, were, I mean, it just had turned a lot of things. I sold it to a guy and I'm, I'm sure he, 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 he could use it forever. You can get parts for him and everything. But, um, I was paging through this, this silly turning catalog, looking at all the stuff that I definitely do not need. And um, I mean, they, they, there's just so much stuff for turning. You, you wouldn't believe and how expensive all this stuff is. Um, so I'm paging through and, and all of a sudden I come upon these robust lathes and I'm like, whoa, what is this? And it's, uh, it's, it's American made. So it's, it's it, you know, it doesn't, nothing's in metric. Like there's, there's a lathe company in Canada that makes a really nice lathe that, that I thought about upgrading to, but everything's in metric. So I would have to replace all of this stuff. Um, so I just went and saw it at some, I don't know, some Turner in Wisconsin's, the rep for him in his barn. I just went and looked at him and just ordered one that day and 
and it showed up, you know, 10 weeks later and it's, it's been fantastic. It does the same thing. It turns stuff at high RPMs, but my work doesn't look any different, but it's, it's really stable. Looks really good. I don't have to take, I don't have, there, there's some operations where I have to take a bunch of stuff apart, um, you know, to do outboard turning this thing. You don't have to take anything apart. You can just slide all the stuff to one side. Yeah. So it's great, but yeah, I can give you a little, I wish my showroom looked better. I, I tour you through there and show you some work, but, but, um, yeah, it's brutal. I, I'm That's not going to take you in there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Give us what you got, brother. So what is, how does this work? Do I, how do I turn it around on here? Um, there should be like a, a, a thing on there you can hit. And oh, there it is. Oh yeah. Bingo. All right. So this is an old, this is an old cannery and this is the spray booth for it. So all those air units are just ah. basically old, uh, well, their makeup air but it's just a big dust collection system it doesn't work anymore in fact they they pulled all the electrical stuff out of it but so this is kind of my room so this is my bench area um shared table saws uh that's kind of my space bench space here's my new lathe nice. this, this this stuff's probably just boring to Never. people but Never. <laughs> so there's the big robust lathe. Just moved it in, started turning. That's a duplicator. Uh, what is your most important tool in your shop? One, name one. Uh, it's not very sexy, but I kind of like the wide belt sander. We use that an awful lot. So this is all shared space. Same deal, windows everywhere. Beautiful. There's the wide belt sander. There's the joiner. I'll take you back to Duff's. Show you what these musky baits look like. So this is what he makes. Wow. Crazy. Now, what so, are they for? Fishing for giant muskies on fresh water. So they're after like these 60 inch fish with these things. Um, he used to be a furniture maker. There's some of his old table bases up there. And then he, he just got into uh, fishing and started making these baits. And he can't, he can't make them fast enough sells them all over the place and then these guys collect them they have to get them in all kinds of different colors and and finishes so that's about it my showroom i'll show you the door to it <laughs> <laughs> that's where it is all right when it's fixed up it's really nice there's the casework piece we're always doing some sort of casework pieces that the credenza has been a um kind of a famous piece i'd probably made a hundred of those things probably make well i don't know probably make at least a dozen of them a year this is kind of cool out here on my door it's in downtown minneapolis rail yard so back when this was uh when, when they made cans it's ba it was basically like a big printing press so they got this rail spur here and there were these, uh, those saddles down there for big tanks and they'd bring a railroad car in here and pump, I don't know what, chemicals or whatever. And then they would mix all this stuff, all the colors down here. And then it would get pumped up into where I am and they would spray it. And it was basically, I don't know if they'd spray it, but it was, it, I think that they'd roll the stuff out. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, on aluminum and then they would cut it all, shear it all, and then form these cans. So, motorcycle parking. So, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Business sign. That's about it. Very nice. Yeah, not bad. All right, I'll flip this thing around again. 
All right, yeah. Well, I I appreciate it, man. Thank thank you very much for for your time and yeah. sharing your space with us. Yeah, my pleasure, man. I I love what you're doing too. Um, I mean, it, you're you're really providing this great service for people, and uh, it's 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 amazing. And you're great at it too. I have to say, you have you have a a, a nice warmth about you. So. Um, I appreciate it. And you're engaging. And uh, I know you're a workaholic, too. So uh, don't work too hard. Right. Yeah. yeah and, and, and as are you. But, you know, got to do what it is. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Next time I'm in New York, I'll try to swing by. Yes. Next time you next time you're past not in New York. Next time you're passing through. Yeah. In September. Yeah. Coming through. So I'll, I'll holler at you. And Dave Stein back at you, brother. All right, man. Take care. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. See you. See you.